Back now is Raymond Arroyo, and also joining us is Craig Shirley, presidential historian, biographer. Uh, Raymond, I love that story. Mm. I have chills. I have chills watching it. I get teared mm. up watching it. Yeah. What was the big takeaway? Well, the, the big takeaway, Laura, is the ingenuity of the American worker and the American entrepreneur here on the ground, in at home, and that unity of purpose they all had that they were fighting the war at home on the streets of New Orleans. Blacks, whites, women, underage boys were working around the clock to build these landing crafts. And as Churchill said, two empires are tied up in some GD things called landing crafts, and they were. Uh, Craig Shirley, it's so great to have you on tonight. I know um, you've been here many times uh, to Normandy. I want to read something that David uh, Christinger wrote in the New York Times Magazine that really struck me on my way over here from uh, Paris tonight. Most men in the first wave never stood a chance, but Allied troops kept landing wave after wave. It wasn't bombs, artillery, or tanks that overwhelmed the Germans. It was men, many of them boys, really, slogging up the beaches and crawling over the corpses of their friends that won the Allies a toehold at the western edge of Europe. I got teared up. I feel like I'm going to start bawling during the show because every grave behind us represents a life cut short and given for our freedom. And, Craig, you've written so much about this over the years. Um, tell us what's going through your mind tonight. Well, I'm thinking, uh, listening tonight, Laura, and watching the last day or so, is, is that the, the page is turning in history and the book is closing on the last uh, generation. So thank God that the ones who are alive are there to, to celebrate this monumental uh, challenge. You know, our old friend Lynn Nofsinger, who was uh, worked for Ronald Reagan for so many years, was one of those uh, rangers on one of those troop transports and was on Normandy on, on June 6, 1944. Years later, I was having lunch with uh, Lynn, and I just happened to look down at his hand and, and notice that his two fingers on his left hand were gone. And I always thought he lost them in a power, power tool accident. And I asked him, I said, Lynn, what, what, what happened to your left hand? He said, Nazi shrapnel. Uh, he he'd climbed the cliffs, mm -hmm. and he put his hand up, and, his, and half his hand was, uh, was blown away. But he never, he never bragged about it. He never talked about it. Like most of the greatest generation, they came back and went back to work. You know, a lot of them, you know, didn't like to right. talk about it until, until recently. Uh, but he told me is that the seas were so, uh, so, were, were so wavy and so un uncontrollable that by the time they got to the Normandy beach, they were ankle deep in uh, puke from all the other uh, troops uh, on board they were the so uh, troop sick. carrier. Yeah, and, and so we sick. think, and we think we were talking about this. We were talking about this on the way over tonight. Uh, you know, it's, it's pretty cold out here tonight. It's maybe 40 degrees, uh, and you know, it's you know, it's like live TV. You're doing 10, 20 million things. We stop and we say, wait a second. Think about what was happening 75 years ago at this hour Think about what, in the dark. Yes, they, and they didn't right. know where they were. Their compasses, half of them were broken. Yeah. They didn't know what they were going to come upon. But, and have Lord, we, and Raymond, yeah. have we gotten a little soft here? Well, as you know, Craig, only a few of the men in those early transports made it out of the transports. Mm -hmm. 30 of this 36 men were killed instantly because of the German crossfire that they were encountering yes. hitting the beach. So, you know, they didn't call this bloody Normandy for nothing. Go ahead, Craig. No, I was just going to uh, uh, say that, uh, that think of the logistics but planning the D-Day invasion. You're moving the population of a mid-sized city, 150,000 men, and tanks, and cargo, and, and uh, jeeps, and medical supplies, and food supplies, and guns, and ammo, and all the other things. The logistics that went into the planning of the D-Day invasion are really staggering, if you really think about it. Yeah. Moving that 150,000 with all those munitions and supplies then 22 miles across the open sea through choppy waters to then land, as Raymond said, in the murderous uh, uh, Nazi crossfire. Uh, we played this soundbite, I think, last night. Everything's blurring into one day here, but uh, of the Queen and what she said uh, this week about shared sacrifice. It's worth watching again. The anniversary of D-Day reminds us of all that our countries have achieved together. After the shared sacrifices of the Second World War, Britain and the United States worked with other allies to build an assembly of international institutions. Craig, uh, they said Trump would wreck the international institutions. NATO wouldn't survive Trump. 
And here, he's in a few hours, he'll be here with other world leaders to celebrate this alliance and uh, honor those who served and those who uh, are buried behind us. Yeah, I think his uh, speech tomorrow is going to be uh, important for him. I think that that's an understatement. Uh, if I was giving him advice, Reagan spoke so eloquently uh, on the 40th anniversary about the past and kind of bringing closure to it. Uh, Trump should almost be symmetrical and talk about the future, the future of the alliance, the future of the United States, the future of uh, the Western alliance, the future of freedom, opportunity, and hope and uh, challenges for all the, uh, for all the uh, people who are, who, are part of, who are part of the original uh, war against the Axis yeah. powers, but the expanded, the expanded countries as well. Uh, look to the future. Uh, Craig, thank you so much.